Cheers, everyone. Welcome to episode 100 of the Tea With Me podcast with me, Shane Todd. And I did a cheers, and then I didn't take a little sip of my tea because I'm worried that some people go, I don't like the sound of you dry. I don't give a fuck. It's episode 100. Mm. It's episode 100 of this thing, which is nuts because we only really started this in, I think it was February last year, just before lockdown. Was it? I don't know. But what I do know is we've come a long way. We've come a long way without you, my friend. I like that song a lot, that song by Charlie Puth. Or <laughs> Puth, not Puth. <laughs> hey, if I was called Charlie Puth, I would tell people, because Puth, like, Puth sounds like the noise you make when you sit down on a, uh, you know, like a big chunky settee, big chunky leather settee, Puth. But yeah, I would 100% tell people my name is Charlie Puth. Just, just to amuse myself. You know, but uh, but yeah, what about when that song, it's been a long day, when it came out and then and it was used in Fast and Furious and it was about Paul Walker, really, Paul Walker and Vin Diesel and I like the message that that was conveying because obviously like, I mean I like Fast and Furious films, I know they're not, you know, they're not going to win Oscars but they're fun, it's a bit like this podcast, look it's not going to win at the World Podcast Awards in the Latin section. But it hopefully is a bit of fun. Yeah, when that when that song came out, why, why have I taken seven minutes just to, just to get my thought on this? So yeah, they had like a CGI Paul Walker in one car, and then actual Vin Diesel in the other car. What they should have done is also CGI Vin Diesel because Vin Diesel just looked like Vin Diesel, a guy, and Paul Walker looked like he had been animated. And I thought that was a bit weird. It was a nice gesture, but part of me was going, just animate big Vin too. You know, but these things happen. Fast and Furious. I mean, I don't know how many fast... I think I've been in a few of the Fast and Furiouses. You know, it, it, there's been that many of them. I remember when I went to see the first one, I took a girl on a date. We went to see Fast and Furious. And um, and this actually happened on my first date as well. She brought two of her friends. She thought it was like a group thing. And I and I didn't. And I was just terrible by myself. And uh, and, that's, and that's what it is. Oh, I miss the cinema. Anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't really go to the cinema. Look... I'm just, ner- for God's sake, I'm nervous because it's episode 100. It's a milestone. And, you know, I've said this in the podcast before, but I used to do a podcast called The Shane Todd Cast, which would win at the World Podcast Awards for best title, The Shane Todd Cast, but it was sporadic. You know, it was a little bit like your dad. You, you, it was around for a while then it sort of went away, then it would come back, and you were like, yes, and you got two episodes in a row, you know, you got the same two weeks in a row, and then you just didn't see it for six months. Which is not what, as a child, happened with my dad. That makes it sound like I had a terrible story like that. I don't. But I do remember a childhood friend who said that their mum's boyfriend, he, he was like, oh, I'm just going to the chemist to pick up a prescription, then he never came back. And I was too young to ask this question, but I said, what was he going to get? Like, why was he away? What, why did he get lost? And then my friend was like, no, he, he left us. Like, But part of me was going, well, maybe there was just a big queue. You know, my mate said, well, the, what would he be getting that was worth waiting? You know, this happened seven years ago. So, what, you know, why would why would he be waiting seven years in, in a queue for a chemist in Bangor? That's too specific. But we've had them all on the pod. We've had some amazing... Let me just look through some of the guests that we've had here. Because here's what we're doing. It's like the last day of term. We're having a wee bit of a celebration. I've got a guest. It's a Paddy's Day special. And the title gives it away. St. Patrick himself. I have got Paddy Barnes coming on the pod today to join me as my guest. I love Paddy. He's a national treasure. He's brilliant. And uh, I've wanted to get him on the podcast for ages. But it was one of those ones where... At the time I was trying to do it, the restrictions kept changing, you know, and, and I was like, yeah, we might be able to do it, then we weren't, then we were, then we weren't. So we're doing it over Zoom, but when we get the studio sorted, we'll bring him in and uh, and hopefully he'll, he'll be up for doing an episode. But, uh, and then next week, we've got another Patrick, we've got Patrick Hilde next week, so, you know, roll, maybe we just keep going and we always have Patricks. We have Sir Patrick Stewart, Paddy McGuinness. Now nah, we'd have to end it there because I don't really know any more Paddies. Uh, well, so... Yeah, oh, we've had, Jesus, we've had, we've had them all. The first ever episode we did of this podcast, I'm pretty sure was, hold on, 
Oh, there's old Shane Talkcast episodes. They're still up there if you care. Um, the first ever episode was a solo episode, I think. Yeah, the first tea with me was a solo episode, and then and there's no video for it, which is weird. Then the second episode was with Sam Halliday from Two Door Cinema Club. That was my first guest interview in the old studio, which we put so much work into, and then left as soon as I started doing this podcast. Then Stephen Watson was the second guest. Jim Owen. You know, they, they, then we're in lockdown, like nine, ep- well, eight episodes in, we were really in lockdown. So then I just started asking like a load of different people. Episode 11, Eamon Holmes, 13, Jamie Dornan, which obviously is the most listened to episode that we've ever done and was just so much fun as as an episode. Uh, let me see, Liam McCord, Owen Colgan, these are just ones that are catching my eye, Jamie Lee O'Donnell, and loads of solo ones as well, and I will get back to doing more solo episodes, then obviously I've had, you know, the likes of Kieran Bartlett on, Mickey, Colin, Dave, Aaron McCann, I've had a load of friends on, like a load of times, Paddy McDonnell, of course, Uh and just yeah, loads of so I I always say I'm gonna get back into solo episodes. I haven't done one in a long time, but I definitely will get back into them. Uh, I mean, just listen to some of these titles: "Burning the Digit," "Little Money Toad," "Slim Shaney," "The Way the Cookie Crumbles." How has this been going for a year? Christian Nairn from Game of Thrones. Aaron Butler's been on for a load of episodes. Terry George, Oscar-winning director. Um, and these are all on YouTube on my channel if, if you ever want to go back and watch any of them. Then some of my favourite comedians like Joe List, Yanis Pappas, Mark Normand, uh, Connor McNeil, the great local actor was on, who, who's absolutely killing it. And see, er, genuinely, like people say, uh, and I'm, by the way, the last episode with Sean McComb went down so well. People, when I'm chatting to them about the podcast, whether it's in the shop or out and about, um, people always say, is anybody a dick? you know, that I've had on, or did any, has anyone not been like the way you would think? Genuinely, right, there's nobody I've had on that I wouldn't have back on, and the only episode I've done where I went on oh, no was when I had um, Todd Barry on, who is a phenomenal stand-up based in New York. I mean, if you watch or listen to the podcast regularly, you know I have a wee bit of a an obsession with the New York comedy scene and I mention I find some way to mention in every podcast I've gigged in New York and I had Tall Barry on and Tall Barry's a very dry comedian he is so good but he, he's like the one speed and he, he is a real um original act and I got it wrong with what I thought it was going to be. You know, sometimes you think when you have a comedian on, you just sort of go, tell me a funny story, and you leave them to it. Um, So it was kind of me who, like, not messed up the episode, but definitely uh, you can go back and listen to it. Let's just say my interview skills were were very poor on it. And that is very, what would you say, big of me to say that, because I'm a very humble and talented guy. But, um, But honestly, I mean... Any any message I get on Instagram or Twitter or whatever where people say, and look, I'm not getting thousands of these, but you know what I mean, where somebody goes, oh, I listen to the podcast every week, it keeps me seeing during lockdown or it gives me a laugh during lockdown, like that means so much. And it, it's class for me to do it as well because you feel like you are, in a way, performing to an audience or uh, even though it's way more laid back, you're still interacting with an audience. So i got to say a big thank you to anybody who's listened to or watched the podcast in the last year and we've done 100 episodes I think by episode 200 I would hope that we have a let's just say a better setup because obviously because of COVID my setup at the minute quite a lot of the times is my kitchen I'm normally in my living room but I've, I've moved I've transferred into my kitchen so um, we're work, we're going to see more studios in the next couple of weeks and get ourselves like a bigger a bigger place to work out of and do the video podcast and that kind of thing. So the podcast is growing all the time. And uh, I see that with the amount of people who download and listen to it and try and listen to you lot as much as possible for potential guests that people want on as well. You know, I I just go for it. Like, I just ask. And if people don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. Like, obviously, the famous time where I asked 
Snoop Dogg to do the podcast, but I copied and pasted a message I just sent to Jamie Fox. Snoop Dogg was the next person I messaged, and I started the message to Snoop Dogg with, hey, Jamie. So I think if it wasn't for that, he would have done it. In fact, I think if it wasn't for that, he would be co-hosting the podcast, and it would be called Tea With Me, and also a, a, a Big Fat Blunt. Oh, uh, <laughs> a big fat blunt is also Cockney Ryman slang. Not for Snoop Dogg. I'm not slamming Snoop Dogg. Don't start a beef between me and Snoop. Imagine that. Imagine I just got into like a full beef with Snoop Dogg, and it really like escalated. You know, like like I was over in LA, you know, getting into scuffles in a nightclub, and then he's you know <laughs> he's in the Maypole Bar in Hollywood throwing bottles at me. It'd be a bit of fun. I would definitely be up for it if he is. So, Snoop, if you're watching, let's get it going, you <laughs> twat. <laughs> I love Snoop Dogg. There's a Snoop Dogg song I love called Lay Low, which is on one of the albums of Snoop Dogg's that I bought before, which sounds like a lie, but genuinely, I have a couple of Snoop Dogg albums. This one had a cartoon. Was it called Dog Pound? It had a cartoon dog behind prison bars on the front, and it's him and Nate Dogg, and any song with Nate Dogg was always good. You know, and I wish Nate Dogg had just experimented with more artists who weren't all necessarily just rappers, like, speaking of Blunt, like James Blunt. Um, and I was going to do a impression of what that would sound like, but I don't have enough time to come up with it. <laughs> this podcast is sponsored, before we get into the episode, with Paddy Barnes, who I'm such, I said it earlier in the podcast, I'm such a big fan of. Um, I was a big fan of him when he was boxing. I thought he was a real entertainer, and the sort of guy that, and I don't know a lot about boxing, but he, I feel a lot of boxers like are very methodical about who they fight, you know, they go, right, well I want to have five, five fights taking it easy and then I'll try and step up a bit and then eventually I'll fight this guy, Paddy Barnes always just seemed that like real Belfast spirit, he seemed to just always want to fight the best guy, take the biggest fights, he wanted to win a world title quickly, I think he wanted to like break a record for the quickest person to a world title, from the amateurs, I think I might have that wrong. He'll definitely correct me on that. But um, but he's just a, a brilliant character and the nicest guy. He was in Belfast Blues. He killed it in Belfast Blues. He's, like, we were fucking up all these takes so bad. Paddy Barnes shows up wearing a, um, a Canada Goose jacket in the Holy Lands where we're filming. He does two takes and then he goes... And it, it was mas- genuinely masterful acting. He killed it and did exactly what we wanted him to do. Um, but yeah, we're sponsored by Manscaped before I bring Patty on on my Patty's Day uh, episode. Uh, we're sponsored by Manscaped.com. Manscaped, as you know, is a number one in men's below the belt grooming. All right, you know they've got the lawnmower 3.0 for, uh, let's just say, whacking your weeds. You know what I'm saying? Like, it literally, like, if, let's be upfront about it if you want, because. You know, there's period art in Belfast that people are freaking out about and taking down because it seems that some men, some people in Belfast are too scared to talk about periods. I'm not scared to talk about periods. Not that I'm not scared, but like, listen, it depends how it's brought up. You know, <laughs> you know, if, if I'm at the garage and somebody just comes up to me right beside me and breaks social distance and things and just says, period, thoughts. I would, I would be uncomfortable, but if you want to have a sit-down conversation about periods, I, I will do that, but I don't know why you'd want to have it with me. <laughs> but let's talk about pubes. <laughs> Let the, p- talking about pubes is a gateway into talking about periods. So, um, yeah, manscaped.com, the lawnmower 3.0. Essentially, Manscaped have all the best male grooming products you could ever think of. Ball toner, ball cleanser, ball deodorant, ball wipes, and to top it off, the lawnmower 3.0. They have a great travel kit. I use it. Producer Dan uses it. Anyone who has a podcast in Europe or North America uses it. Because <laughs> every podcast is sponsored by Manscaped because they're just taking over. They're like this podcast. Manscaped.com. Check it out. Have a look. Great gift idea. You can use the code Tea with me for 20% off and free shipping. Got to plug another couple of things real quick. I'm doing another night at Belfast SSA Arena. Mad that I'm doing one. Hey. I'm doing two. Hey, tickets for the second one. Shoo, flying. Shoo, shoo, flying. People people saying, you know, putting up Instagram stories saying, oh, I'm in the second row, I'm in the third row, I'm in the fourth row. Get the good tickets. Get them. I'm doing it on the 6th. I think this is right. The 6th of November and the 13th of November. You can get tickets on Ticketmaster, my brand new show, Chancer. 
Also, I'm going to plug uh, the TV show that's on tonight, me and Dave Elliott. The Rave Lockdown is on BBC One Northern Ireland tonight, 10.45. It's the radio show done on TV. You'll see me posting about it. Um, it was a real laugh to do it. I haven't seen it. I don't know how it turned out. It was a lot of fun in the night, and I think if we can, if we can show how much fun it was, I think people will enjoy it. And it, look, you can't. Go, it, it's shit that you can't go out for Paddy's Day. And I'm not saying this as a substitute, but maybe if you want to crack open a stout and and have a drink with the boys on TV, that'd be a good way to do it. So the rave lockdown tonight, which is the night this came out, but you can get it on high prayer if you're watching it after this. 10.45 BBC One Northern Ireland last thing patreon.com slash tea with me podcast if you want to support the podcast if you want to get a bonus episode on Monday Tuesday Thursday and then on Friday because I do breakfast brew which is short daily podcasts um, on Friday we do a zoom live podcast and my voice broke when I said live Stephen Watson live if you want to um you know, join those. You can ask questions as we do it live, and that's what we want to do in the new studio. We want to get into uh, a place where we can live stream the podcast once a week, like we do on Fridays, but obviously make it look class and have actual guests in. Patreon.com slash tea with me podcast. We'll put it in the link down below. But let me welcome, because it's Paddy's Day, let me welcome the, pa- the patron saint of boxing himself, the main man, my friend. Please welcome to the Tea with Me podcast, Paddy Barnes. It's Paddy's day, of course I've got to have the man himself on, Paddy Barnes. Paddy, my first question for all my guests is, do you drink tea or are you sort of in the coffee camp or what, what's your relationship with tea? Well, every morning I would have a cup of coffee, but during the day I would have about three or four cups of tea. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to cut down because I have three sugars in every cup. And any any three sugars, but that then that's not tea. You're just you're just drinking sweet water, basically. And, and that's I just love the taste of it. I don't know what it is. So I um, used to I got into tea because whenever I was a kid, my granny used to leave me. This is stinking now, but a bit of her tea. I don't know if uh, like loads of people actually you find getting tea because that my granny took like two three sugars like you're saying and would leave me a bit of her tea. So I would drink cold cold sweet tea um, and then I always had sugar and then I eventually weaned myself off it and now the idea of drinking sugar and tea disgusts me like, <laughs> no, you know what Did you say my granny is a reason that I have so much sugar in my tea as well because she used to have it herself yeah and I can it her but tell me this when you're drinking tea yeah do you have a Twix do you have a Twix mm-hmm. or, or, or sorry have you ever had a Twix where you bite both ends off and use it as a straw. See stuff like that. That's stuff I don't. If you do that, then fair enough. But that stuff I don't believe happens. Like people say, "Oh, I dip my chips in my McFlurry." I don't know anybody does that. I think it's just made up. But Everyone, you, please do it. Well, I and can't back be, I can't eat Twixes because I can't. I can't have dairy because I'm, you know, from Hollywood and from North Town, and we all have dairy allergies. But uh, I, I actually, actually, <laughs> actually can't. But there are Twix alternatives I can have. So what give, happens? What happens if you have dairy? Do you die? Let, <laughs> <laughs> because believe me, this is worth this is worth death. I mean, no, <laughs> thankfully I don't die. But I mean, what a way to go! Be like, <laughs> how do you die? I COVID, mean, no Twix. How <laughs> do you go? He took a, a party size Twix, and uh, you know, God, God bless him. No, I would just. I'd be okay if I had a wee bit of dairy, but if I had a little bit more, let's just say I would need a toilet nearby. Okay, I get you now. Well, this is worth a trip to the bog, believe me. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I do spend Easter just sitting on the toilet. Just I, want <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and the I think Sean McComb got me into that there. The, the tricks. Yeah, Sean McComb on a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you saw that, but if you did... Did it surprise? Did you feel like that was someone you didn't know talking when he was saying about froth milk and hot milk and all that kind of thing? Like yeah. he, he changed, like because he's never made me one of those, so no. I was surprised and disappointed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Froth milk. I could, I can believe. It. Like I just met. Like I've never met him. We just talked online, and uh, and we we went. I just went. Like let's get a takeaway coffee before the podcast, 
and he said, like, oh, could I get hot milk with it? And I, I didn't know where to look. I was like, oh, Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> Joking or what? You you and me have I, I don't know if you remember, but you and me have been out for a coffee. Yeah. In Glasgow. In, in Cla- Glasgow, right? Glasgow. Me, you and Tony McKenna. And Tom McKenna, yeah, you're right. I tell you what, that's three big hitters. <laughs> that's three big hitters. It was indeed. Yeah, yeah. And then we went that was that there was that night we went to see you stand up. Yeah, it wasn't a good gig. I thought it was a good gig. Do you know what the problem was? I mean, it's sometimes the slightest things in stand up really threw you off. Because it was in a nightclub, it was in the garage yeah. in, in Glasgow. The stage, it was like a nightclub DJ stage, it was so high. And I don't know if you remember, the audience were like way down below me. And there wasn't yeah, like you're right, actually, yeah. It was, it, it was just a weird one. I mean, it was okay, but it was, it was a bit of a weird one. But you had a, you had a hot chocolate when we went for... Were you, were you putting on weight? Were you moving on? I was trying to lose a bit. Oh, you were losing weight? All right. Oh, yeah, that's right. I think you got a hot chocolate. <laughs> You got hot chocolate and Costa, and then you were like, oh, I'm trying to be strict my weight, and I thought you were going to like bin the hot chocolate, and you took a few of the marshmallows off. <laughs> yeah, it really counts. And then you went to a shop and bought a Twix. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him what. Yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's, look, there's loads there's loads that I want to talk to you about um, in, in boxing, outside of boxing. But see, first of all, can we talk about you you gave me one of the funniest moments and sometimes if I ever like feel down or slightly unhappy, I know that if I watch the video mm. review that your wife took falling off a bike in New York, I know if I watch that, I will feel so much better and so much happier. Like for anyone who hasn't seen it, <coughs> you were in were you in Central Park just on holiday? Yeah, Central Park, yeah. For a and, weekend. Um Mary, your wife was was filming and you were on a like a bike that you have behind her and I don't know what happened whether the steering the handlebars went back to front or whatever but you just coped and it's it's a perfect timing because it's right at the end of the video do you know why the video went up for she didn't hit stop she yeah. fell for a bit laughing <laughs> like, people people watch that but genuinely think it was staged because yeah. how could that happen like, <laughs> I generally hit, I thought I had to thump the back brake to pull the skin. But I was pulling That's the right. ball really, and it went over it. And I, I was raging because I thought, like, I'm bothered by Canada's coat there. Yeah. I thought it was ripping the shreds. I didn't curve up my back. I thought it was ripping my, my coat. But thankfully, uh, some Italian fella who were in, uh, asked me if it was okay, and I got up. After that, about five minutes later, I was flying down, no hands, hands in the back, flying. <laughs> so. I'm not getting a diet, eh? It was all right in the end. <laughs> yeah, that would be two terrible ways to die. Me with chocolate and you falling off a bike, because that is a yeah. childlike thing. I, Whenever I was about 18, I, I, I didn't drive until I was 21, and I, I used to cycle everywhere, right? Uh, and I was cycling from my house down in the Hollywood town centre, and I, I fell off my bike, and I went over the handlebars, and my, like, look at this, right? And if anyone's not watching the video version of the podcast, watch it for this. See the difference between my wrists? See oh, this? Yeah, see the bone, yeah. See a bone? I went over the handlebars, landed with my hand like this, and then the bone just went through my hand. And I had to go up to the hospital, like obviously straight away. My dad took me up to the hospital. And the woman at reception up at the Ulster was like, can you tell me what happened? And I said, yeah, I fell off my bike. I've had an accident. And she said, was it a motorbike? And I, I, I just had to go... <laughs> Nah, it was like a boy's bike. It was like a, it was like a child's <laughs> bicycle. A Rolly Max, a BMX. <laughs> yeah. So, so while I was laughing at your video, exactly the same thing has happened to me. And uh, yeah, that's not good. Like no, was, but here actually, before we even go into the podcast any further, obviously, people know me. Can't really talk properly. You talk too fast. Yeah. But it could be even worse than my because I'm wearing Invisalign on my teeth. I mean, so have a list basically a bit because right. of this break. I did the Invisalign thing as well, and it's class. It's and I like your book too. But here, if anybody watch this here and they want Invisalign themselves, go to Granted Dental, Barnes 50, promo code, and that's the dip. <laughs> uh, that's serious. That's a serious plug. I mean, yeah, it would be funny to do it as a joke, but then it's even funnier when you're like, no, genuinely, that would no, be real. It's good. real. Unbelievable. Did you approach them and say, like, listen, you just know me, sort out my teeth, or or was did they approach you? 
I, I just been well in said, listen, love, I need these nicer specs, so yeah, let's do it. And do is that, is that one of the things with boxing? You wouldn't really do anything like that, like while you're still boxing, because <laughs> although you, if you weren't a gum shield, you wouldn't get your teeth that damaged, would you? No, you'd be surprised. There's people who do get their teeth knocked out even with a gum shield in. So, like, my tooth was bent. Yeah. And, like, there was no point in getting it fixed in boxing. But now, after I'm retired, um, I think it's just an influencer now. I love that. Yeah, the reason we teeth straight, make it thread in my face, hair done. I mean, that'd be great. We see in our, this time next year, it'd be great. See, whenever you see, like, the, you know, the Sunday World or Sunday Life will do a story going, you know, these paramilitaries say they've no money, but they're, they've all gone to Turkey to get the teeth and the hair done. Part of me looks at that and goes, that would be a decent trip. The bit, politics aside, that sounds like a decent trip. 100%. <laughs> coming back. Coming. But here's the mistake to make, right? You and me are doing Invisalign. I, well, I did it like a year ago. And if you're ever in Lisburn Road, quote Todd for, I'm only joking. Um, <laughs> but but uh, imagine, imagine I have my own deal and I just edited your bit out of the podcast. <laughs> God, I, I would take you to court. <laughs> um, yeah, the, get, like getting the teeth done. The problem people from here make when they go to like Turkey and get the teeth done is they go for like the brightest white. They go for the brightest white and that looks stupid. But I understand They've had a few drinks. They've had a few fish bowls in Bodrum or wherever they are in Turkey, and they go, "Listen, may as well just do it. Give me the highest shade." Yeah, when I get mine done, finished off, I'm gonna ask for like a Belfast yellow tint. Yeah, <laughs> just to stay yeah. normal, <laughs> just to keep your feet in the ground. Yeah. yeah. What was the thing? Was it at the Olympics? You had the you had the sign about sponsorship. Was that the was that the opening ceremony of the Olympics? Yeah, that was the opening ceremony of the London Olympics 2012 because I remember like we're in the hotel, the, sorry, the, the village ring beforehand and the psychologist, Jay Hussey, saying, Paddy, you have to do something more than like me. Why? It was because there's millions and millions of people watching this here. You know what I mean? Hey, Jay, you know what? You're right. What do you? <laughs> so I said, well, I ain't going to do this here. So I'm going to get sponsors, open for sponsorship and you hand wrote it, right? Didn't but you? anyway, I put here, I wrote it and like a birdie fitted in with tour handle. Yeah. That's how stupid it was. Like, it didn't even make it clear. But here, 30,000 followers in about four hours. It's crazy. I mean, obviously, the opening ceremony at the Olympics, especially London, is one of the biggest TV events in history. Um, and I imagine what you're told to do is just like be like the rest of the athletes, sort of like, you know, represent who you're representing with the head up and be respectful and stuff. When you wrote out, basically, like, you sponsored my Twitter, did you get, was there, uh, like, follow from that? Like, did you get shit for that from anyone? Um, I can't remember, but I think there was words spoke with the coaches. But yeah. here, I didn't give a shit. I can do what I want. But they weren't, they weren't going to stop me, like. Yeah. Because they're there overseeing and stuff. I understand, like, the shit the mission needs to do the job and that, but I didn't care. You know, I, I seen an opportunity. Yeah. And I went and grabbed it, and I paid off. Did you have people like because Paddy? Did you start working on Paddy Power around that time? So I tell you what, 2016, mm-hmm. I worked with Paddy Power and they had like a, a thick Twitter beef. So that's right. And then they renamed the shop in Dublin, I think it was Dorset Street, Paddy Barn instead of Paddy Power. Yeah. But the plan was um, so I was favorite for gold and 2016, and not that many people know this, but the deal was me to change my name by Depot to Paddy Power. <laughs> but well, it, it couldn't be done. Like, uh, the Olympic rules, because it was too long a period, I, I qualified as Paddy Barnes, they wouldn't let me do it. But I was definitely game for it. So you were going to change your name by, you were going to change your name legally? Yeah, to Paddy Power. I was all hard. I was all hard. Big money. Uh, would you have changed? Would you have changed it back? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> I would have milked it until I until I it back. I love that. Yeah, and, and yeah, and then you're just like like of any other betting companies. You could be Paddy Coral. You could be Paddy Betfair. Whatever. Paddy Bet. Do you think like that? Paddy Grantcher Dental. <laughs> Paddy Barn Fifty. <laughs> 
Uh, I love that. I mean, it's one of those things where you think, especially athletes at the Olympic Games and all that, must be very boring as well. Like, you, you know, haven't always like, you know, toe the line and fit in and do that kind of thing. So when you do anything like slightly funny or different, it makes such a big, such a big impression. Like, it's funny to the people outside of the village and the games because, see, in, in, the, in the big village, it's like a high-pressured environment because it's the biggest sport event in the world. Like, people have trained all their lives just to be an Olympian, not even doing the medal or to be good, just, just to be an Olympian. So it's a high-pressured press, environment where, in regards to, like, you know, these people have their life in line to, for, to compete for the country. Now, I did too, but... The reason for me, um, I know this because I've done it, the reason for me being so successful because I was able to mix, you know, high, uh, like high-end sport with fun because, yeah. like, if you were dead serious and, like, trained meticulously and were headstrong, like, it's easy to get, like, down. Like, I, I think you, you feel down all the time if you didn't, like, succeed every single time. So... Well, you're a robot then, aren't you? Like, if you just... Exactly, you're just a robot. Like, more, there's no enjoyment in sport then if you're like that. You know what I mean? If you want to go to my Olympic Games, you know, and you're one of, you're one of those people, like, you know, Espe- do I win that? Like, Espe- like, if you look at, I mean, different sport, but if you look at Tiger Woods, like, I don't know if you watched that documentary recently, that's somebody who obviously is one of the best at all, all, of all time and has achieved so much. But, like, at what cost? You know what I mean? Like you look at the, the 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 drug addictions and and being totally obsessed. It's like you gotta have a life too. Like you absolutely have to have a life, and part of that is yeah, enjoying yourself and having a laugh. And definitely, like, like uh, I've been to the Olympics. You know, five or people from Ireland get to the Olympics. But if I was given a bit of advice, my young kids going through, but um, would be like you know, yes, train hard and dedicate yourself to sport, but equally. Try and enjoy the moment, like don't be like you know it's not the be all or end all. For some, it might seem so, but honestly, enjoy it as much as you can. So that's it's, the only thing I can say. It's probably like a gig in a way. I mean, at the like say the Olympics, the stakes are are obviously higher, but like you can have a bad no matter how much you plan for stand up or back yourself as being really good, you can still have a bad show. And I think you have to kind of be able to laugh about it in a way and just and just write it off as a bad day at the like obviously you want to perform for people like you want to you know perform for your fans for your sponsors all that kind of thing yeah kind of similar to stand up but at the same time if you just have a real bad one that you worked hard for sometimes you do you just have to say like fuck it it didn't work that was that was like with when sean mccomb was on the podcast there and and you know his last fight he did kind of just at the end say like okay he was able to have a laugh and say look it didn't work for me you know and i, I think people Love that as well when they see a human side of someone who is dedicated to what they do. Yeah, see, there you go. Like, you hit me on the head. We are only humans. You yeah. know what I mean? So, we have off days. It's just what happens. You know, even the, for example, of driving a car, like, people make mistakes driving a car. People cry, knock on their stuff. Um, people do silly stuff that they don't mean to do. High end sport, you know, like, you can play to any sport. If you have a bad performance, even by 1%, that could cost you the fight. That could cost you the match. You know, it's just those inches, those percentages. Yeah. Like, so small at the high end of sport that cost you stuff. But listen, we're only humans and losing is a part of life and that's just the way it is. Like, and you have to, it's just the way you, you, you deal with it. A difficult part of boxing though must be that so when I relate it to stand up, if I have a bad gig, I can probably get a gig the next night somewhere, even if it means a bit of travel. I can bounce on a lineup somewhere else, try and make up for it, and and hopefully have a good one. Yeah. One of the bad parts of boxing must be the discipline of the camp, and you can spend months in a camp, and then like you say, you make one mistake, one one mistake in a split second. It's not like the next night you can have another fight. You might have to wait six months or, or more to, to correct it. So you actually probably have a lot of time when you were boxing to think about your mistakes, which isn't always a good thing. Yeah. No, you're right, Nick, because say, you know, you have a 12-week camp and like 
I mean, you're starting your, your, your camp for a fight. Like, you're not, like, building from week one. You're building, basically, from week 12. You're, you're working backwards, you know, so you're ready for that day. And, like, all that training, you know, you, you can be the best shape of your life, you know, mentally focused, physically ready. But, you know, fight day, something stupid could happen, something small could happen, something, a thought go through your mind or you may feel a bit tired that day and it'll affect your performance. And, like, those 12 weeks are at the window because, you know, and, and it, it actually, even in the fight, you have a game plan, you're fighting a certain kind of opponent. It's not working. You know, yeah. you, you go back to what you know and yeah. the pl- the 12-week plan at the window. But it's just about the, the best athletes know to just learn to adapt and learn to overcome certain situations. So, see with, see with dedication, like, and, and in terms of, you know, boxers being so disciplined and into what to do like you were w- w- I think you came on the ra- well you did you came on the radio show years ago and we were just talking about it briefly a bit but I don't know whether you based yourself or you were travelling up the likes it was a clock or our glass yeah so when, as a kid like as a young kid to box yeah so I, I was glad my, my cousins lived in our glass um, like at the stage I've been boxing a week um, in Belfast, because my mates boxed, but every weekend I went down our glass, and my cousins boxed down there, as a club down there in Polly Horning, and my uncle was a coach, so just to fit in, I, I boxed, and I had joking, every weekend I sparred, my cousin, fans in London, I, was, I used to be crying, yeah. I used to be, even buttery, but like, shots were hard, he had me bigger than me, and I remember back in the corner, my uncle was saying, you okay, me, yeah, I've hay fever. Like, I wasn't solvent, but there was tears in my eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I just stuck at it because I couldn't. I, I just wanted to fit in, basically. Like, I, I wasn't much good. I wasn't terrible. But because my cousins and my friends don't, I just don't have to stick just to, to fit in, basically. See, whenever, you know, I imagine a lot of people, you, whenever you were a kid that you were boxing with, don't do it anymore, that, you know, fall out of it, go down a different path. The, the the sort of guys that were like beating you and sparring then and and punching you so hard and then you sort of cried a bit. Did you ever get your own back like down the line? Like, did you ever just take the club off, go up to them, blindside them someday and spark them out outside their house? No, because they like, still bother me. They're all bigger than me. I, I can't. I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't beat them. <laughs> you They're um, me, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't have attacked them. Yeah, fair enough. Maybe not. There's a good chippy in our class. I cannot remember any of it, and I know it is nice to be. Um, docks? No, no, it's uh, no, it's in Newcastle. It's right down by the harbour. Yeah, that's a, that's a good spot. That's a good spot. I've only been on once. But There's a bar facing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has, a wee, has a wee sit in. That's a sign of a good chip. Yes, yes. You go in, and you're going to get your takeout, and then you go. Hold on, what's that? Tables and chairs, just that's in a separate room. One of us will think of it before the end, or I'll look it up if I forgot it by the end of the podcast. Um, so, like boxing from a very young age, and then what age did you sort of go into the amateurs at and, and start your? My, my my career was basically started right away because I I started boxing my first time ever on a Wednesday night. That Sunday, I had a fight. Um, so basically, at what age? Eleven. So straight away, I was fighting like a few a few years later. Um, like I was basically fighting every second week as well. Like, how'd, you, how, how'd your first fight go at the age of eleven? Uh, I lost to a fella who I'm friendly with at the minute. A uh, fella from West Belfast, Ian Finnegan. Now, I actually had a remind him a few years ago that I fought him and he beat me in my first ever fight. You didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was fighting quite regularly like, every second week. It's That's nuts. It's crazy. Like, I've had about I would say about three hundred and fifty fights as an amateur. Quite a lot, like. Especially from that from that young age, like, geez, I I, I didn't <clears> think you, I didn't even think you fought till you were like I just presumed like oh maybe when you're fourteen, fifteen, sixteen you started. I, oh, no, like, I enjoy the idea of that like like maybe just being a spectator or maybe that's something after lockdown I'd like to watch just a lot of kids being fucking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. Seeing I like see see the kids nowadays like if I was the age that was if I was. The same t- had the same talent, sorry, as I had when I was a kid. Again, the kids now, yeah, I never would have made it. The kids now are unbelievable. I swear to God. What do you? Why do you think that is? More professional, 
like as in as in there's more like sports science and things like that and or what i don't even i think maybe it's just like high performance maybe maybe falling down to like grass level roots the coaching's better um you know i think success be success so like you have, have the likes of us like when the the Olympics, there's more money invested in sport and then there's more opportunities for kids fighting abroad and like the coaching's getting better so yeah. i think that's a a big factor and i as well i think it's probably due to Kay taylor women's boxing in ireland like i think this Olympics here we're probably more reliant on the females for the greatest success because women's boxing in ireland is massive at the minute like there are, yeah, i mean katie taylor is uh it, it, the, the best probably compliment you can pay to katie taylor is or one of them is you don't think of her as and no disrespect to female boxers, but you don't think of her as or know her as a female boxer. You just know her as a boxer. And in years yeah. gone by, it was probably more, you know, oh, that's, you know, female boxing, or you put someone in the category of a female boxer. She has made, she has put so much uh, eyes on that, on that side of the sport, yeah, on, on female boxers. Like, uh-huh. like just one, one person doing it herself. Like. And her success has like shown girls in Ireland. Yeah. I mean, actually, across the world, that you know, women can do women can do it, which is amazing. And that, now I have likes of Kelly Harden, who won a world title as an amateur for Ireland, and you know, kids are hopefully girls are going to follow her footsteps and and take up boxing too. So we're boxing, boxing, amateur boxing in Ireland is in a good place, especially for for female participation at the minute. Speaking of speaking of amateurs, like you, you're like. And, and and like obviously like you know, Mar- Mary and stuff, and and you've called yourself biscuit ribs on, on a couple of occasions. That was me as my kid. Oh, your son, <laughs> your son. No, we your. Oh, you're. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that I, what I love about you is you can just have a laugh at yourself and don't take. We're talking about a bit earlier. Don't take things too seriously. Yeah. But like genuinely, like you are, like a a legend of Irish boxing, and you I don't I, you might get uncomfortable with me saying that, but like. I, I think you like are are so popular in so many different places in Ireland as well. Like up, up here, down south, I'm, I'm I'm sure, and especially going to Olympic Games and 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 all that kind of thing. Do you was it difficult to decide when to turn pro, or was it an easy decision to stay amateur for quite a while because you were having so much success at it? Uh, to be honest, no. I've never ever had dreams of going professional. Like professional boxing, for me, it's not something I imagine doing. It was never a dream of mine, um, because amateur boxing and professional boxing are two totally different sports. One's a sport and one's a business. So, for me, pro box for me it was always as soon as I stepped foot in Jai Sui's gym at Dolly Family, one thing was was drilled into me: you know, the Olympic dream. So. Once I got to Beijing, I got in the field for it, and I, I just wanted to be an Olympic champion. Yeah. I always want to be an Olympic champion for me, all, all about the Olympics. I suppose, suppose having, um, as well, like just that one dream that all amateur boxers share um, separates it from professional boxing a bit because you have so many belts nowadays. And I, and I by yeah. the way, know very little about it. I'm, no, I'm not a boxing expert at all, but I see that there are so many different champions. So, there are so many different goals yeah. to go for, whereas with amateur, it's like that's the one thing you're going. Yeah, for. Like, so as an amateur Olympic title is like the pinnacle of sport. Um, so obviously, it was it was funded. It was a funded athlete, so it was getting a wage tax free from the, the Irish government and up here, it's for and I, because the box for Northern Ireland the Commonwealth Games, but you know, it was my job, and I remember. I had a meeting with MGM, which are now at TK, um, before Rio, and they asked me to go professional. I said, listen, I've been to the Olympic Games. I was 29 at the stage then. I was like, no, I'm meeting, get the Lord Maids, meeting, allow me to get the Lord one. Um, I'm going to give it a go, but I'll go pro if you promise me, like, if you fast track me the world title, because, you know, in Belfast, I mean, well, I, you say Ireland, but I'm going to say Belfast. There's loads of world champions. We have likes of Burnett, you have likes of Frampton, Wayne McCall. There's loads of world, Abraham McGee, there's loads of world champions, right? 
So I, I just don't want to be a world champion. I want it to be like a safe and realistic, someone special, like, you know, the fastest world champion. Yeah. So yep. I say to the team, I don't care if I lose. I just want the opportunity to try to create history. And they gave me some maniac from the first fight. He lifted me up. Bulgar- um, Bulgarian? Oh, uh, heck yes. I remember reading that report of that fight and thinking it was a, it was a joke. He just picked well, you up at Farman's list. I was so happy because for a debut, for it wasn't, for me it was terrible because he wasn't engaged. He kept running away. And like, your debut, you're meant to sell yourself. I couldn't sell myself because yeah. I was engaged. And then I fought an order during my up that door and said, this is to my head. And like, I can't link up for these fights because they're coming to lose. They're getting paid to lose. Also, some people might fight, what, 10 journeymen, 15 more, you know, just constantly, yeah. constantly building up. But that separates you because you, you just want to fight. And I remember you used to always want to fight the best people. Like, there's a fellow. Which is uncommon. There's a fellow called Donny Nettes. He's actually fighting on the, f- the front of the card yeah. in the back. He's like, Four time world champion. I asked for him in my third fight. Now, looking back, I would have been retired two and one. <laughs> he could have bothered me. <laughs> and that joke would have bothered me. But the third fight, I'll be fought for the WBO European title against a fellow who um, who was robbed in Japan for the world title, was European champion. So he, he wasn't journeyman. And then obviously, I fought for the, I got two more fights. I got a North title fight and then the world title fight in the sixth fight. Um, was I ready for it as a pro? Probably not. Did I care? Absolutely not. Yeah. Because I had the opportunity to create history. Yeah. Uh, boxing, I think it happened. And here, it was boxing well. Um, I, I felt there was been like maybe three or four rounds. And I never was throwing a punch. He just caught me a crack and shot. And I just remember being on the ground. Never hit the heart of the body in my life. Yeah. The referee took the lock and counting and the bell going. And I remember saying to myself, Am I saved by the bell? Because I can't go up. <laughs> I genuinely couldn't go up. I was sore for about two hours after. Yeah. I think I'm the only person ever to go to hospital with concussion from a body shot. Uh, and I took him as hospitalized. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's it's only funny because you don't take yourself seriously, which is which Serious? is incredible. This is true. But I know, but I mean, I, I, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I want to. So obviously, <laughs> I'm back in the room, done a drug test, came back out to watch Front and Fit Luke Jackson. Were you still in agony at that point? I was a bit sore, but tender, right? So I had my clothes on, whatever. And I just left Mari and my mate, her mate, sorry, as well, my user. They were at the team room was. She, yeah. I, I had to watch front for here. Well, no problem. She, she was getting the drink. So I sat said, Rocky, you feeling? We fought the fight. I turn and Rocky, you feeling? says, Rocky, you know what? I don't feel good. <laughs> what? Nah, I think I'm a faint. It's way too potty. And she's like, what? And I was, she's, there's a doctor called Martin Duffy. Right. I was a doctor. I'm going to faint. He goes, what? Me? I'm going to faint. They sit down there, two seconds. You're right. I started feeling a bit better. Then next minute, he's back over. I go by M2 there, to um, paramedics. Me, right. There's a stretcher. Me, I'm not going to stretcher. There's a potty going to stretcher. So the one guy got a stretcher. I land there. <laughs> Wheel out. See the crowd. Maury, at the doorway, Maury said to me, uh, but I just seen the stretch of me. Fuck, I call love who's out there. It was me. Like, face white. <laughs> at the hospital, concussion, body shot, body shot to the head. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. But here, Danny Manny, I, I thought I was going to die. I am a hypochondriac, so I thought that's, that's me dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from a body shot as well. Exactly. But you know what? Let the tail tail. <laughs> <laughs> God, I remember that body shot. And uh, yeah, it's just the, the sound of it as well. You could see the force. And yeah. I mean, people like me can go and you could feel it. Obviously, we couldn't. You know, you, it nearly killed you. Um, but Jesus, that was a fucking 
fucking but, bad. Don't. Was it, I was punched at the same time, so I got the full force of it, like. Because your body was already yeah. t- totally open. Mm-hmm. Jeez, I mean, boxing. Like, I was doing like 30 push a day. Like, I should have been in good shape for it, like, but obviously, I'm. Yeah. Um, Sit-ups are all the shit. That's uh, you, you, speaking of sit up, well, press ups actually, you broke my record. Uh, Q Radio, I wonder what the city beat at the yeah, time. It was, it was city beat at the time. Do you remember they used to do, was it, Steve, was it Stephen Clements' show? It was Stephen Clements, yep. Stephen Clements um, had, a, had a thing on a show where you would do a, a minute, the most press ups, 30, 30 seconds. Yep. 30 seconds. And by the way, his show is always the most crack to go on, like the what most crack to go on. See, see so many people, you kind of you kind of go on. I genuinely, I would say, him and Pete Snodden are very very good at actually engaging you in an interview and taking an interest. And Stephen was just really good at yeah. making it more than just the usual kind of. So, what gigs have you got coming up? Anyway, um, we yeah, it was thirty seconds, many press ups as you could do. Now, there was a leaderboard, like a Top Gear leaderboard, and I remember going in and not really paying attention to the interview. Like, you know, Stephen's there, everyone in the room's laughing at what he's saying. I'm laughing, but in the back of my head, I'm going, all I care about is the 30-second pre- the press-ups. And he went to a track and he said to me, he goes, do you fancy sticking around and doing the press-ups? And I went, ah, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> now, I'd been, like, I'd been thinking about it all, the, all week. and um, I go down, see all the Ulster rugby players on the leaderboard, and I'm thinking, if I can do, I think the top was 51, and I thought something like that, and I thought if I can do 40, I'll be happy. Genuinely, it was 30 seconds. See, after about 20 seconds, I think I'd already beat. I already beat it. I was just, I was just bobbing up and down, like, like the gravity wasn't a thing. I was just bouncing up and down. Kate, uh, Kate, you remember Kate used to put her fist like this on the ground, and you had to hit it, so it was yeah. fair press ups. And anyway, I'm just bouncing up and down doing the press ups. I remember, I remember looking up at Stephen at one point, and he was just like, "This is, this is, he's won it." Like he this guy's athlete. And they put me up on top of the Ulster rugby players who probably weren't really trying, but I was fucking going for it. And they put me up on the leaderboard. And I think you were on the next week, and I think you got fifteen more. But you know what? As I, I cheated. Did you? Yeah. You slipped, slipped Kate a fiver, and you were not touching the. Yeah. You got <laughs> I was just. Bum, 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 bum. You got, I think you got 67. No, I was 62, but I lied. Right, right, right. So I, I, so I, I won. I, you, you, you're, you're the NI champion of press-ups. I cheated, I'll, I'll admit. See, um, when we're talking about that body shot, boxing is one of those things that is a complete... <laughs> I mean, football is one as well, where you're watching football and you're you know criticising Kevin De Bruyne for making a, a certain pass and you're going... He should have slipped. He should have just slipped the easy ball in. Oh no, it's ridiculous. But, but boxing, like I do it with boxing, you know where I'm going. Listen, he needs to, he needs to get off the ropes. He needs to, and it's as if as if he doesn't know he needs to get off the ropes. The fellow's getting absolutely mauled on the ropes. But I sometimes I watch boxing and I go, do you know what? I have a bit of fitness about me. I have a bit of cardio. I can move. I'm quite tall. I I I reckon. I, I would have a wee bit and I went to a boxer size class with a girl from work about 10 years ago and like you taking that body shot I thought I was going to die and it was like mothers it was like mothers doing this thing in the local leisure centre in Hollywood and all you had to do was go at the pads for I think it was two, three sets of two minutes and I I, I, th- I thought I was going to be sick so Matt it's easy to think you know it's easy to watch a, a fight right and like it's easy to visualize you being a boxer. It's easy to visualize yeah. yourself throwing a certain combination and moving yeah. a certain way. But see until you actually, not even in the ring, like stand up in, in a stance and find out that you have no coordination whatsoever. No grace. No balance whatsoever. Yeah. Then you can't punch because like, boxing is solely about coordination and balance. That's two fundamental things about boxing. Coordination and balance. Like, people... Everyone's taught to box a certain way, so hands up, you know, yeah. in a certain stance. But really, I, I, that's actually not right. You know, boxing is individual. So what I mean by that is, it's like 
if you feel comfortable punching in a certain stance, if your balance is perfect while you're throwing that stance and your corner isn't great, then that's your stance. That's why you should box. See, you um, said about most people stand like this. I wouldn't. It's just, I'd, it's be, I'd, be, I'd be Prince of St. Hammond. I'd exactly. be off. I'm, I offer him a chin lick. <laughs> you know, duke away a wee bit left and right, left and right. Me and you just bar. Somebody hits what? Me and you just bar. I can't. I've got a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> you Connor Burns. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I thought you'd enjoy that reference. I, you know what? I would love. I would love to, as long as you didn't hit me. Well, I I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you actually what. I got home from Beijing, right? And there was a felt no, a malar. It was a week before Beijing. A fellow called Johnny Stones. He was a journalist. Sounds like a guy to pick me blinders. <laughs> he, was, he was a journalist, <laughs> right? And he met me in a naughty family. He said, Pi, listen, when you come home from Rio, I, I, I'm doing, sorry, when you go home from Beijing, I'm going to throw on you. Um, but I want to spoil you. But I don't want to spoil you right now. I want to give myself six weeks training um, so I can learn a bit of boxing. But I don't expect whatever. So it was one Saturday morning, I got a phone call. Jay story said, Paddy, yes, fellas, I need to spar you. It's six weeks up. Me, what? I was black the night before me. Fuck, I forgot about this year. I went down, mate. Got me down, me. What age is this guy? He's. At the time, I'd say he's about 40 odds. Right, right. And I was about 21. But, so we didn't ring and I messed about. I was just, what was the person? Just just fainting and was messing about. And he kicked, hit me in the side of the head, my head went flat, flat back. And my mate goes, Oh, Paddy, you got you. I was laughing, Fuck. Next round, I'm not joking, another word of lie, I'm out like, next round, and um, fractured two of his ribs. <laughs> and that is a legit story. And that was the end of him. Did he, what did he die? He, 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 yeah, he laughed. He was just sagged down the corner. I couldn't pop, breathe properly, but he was laughing. But trying did, to laugh. Did he write the article? Yeah, he did I? And was he okay? Was I'm he not trying to paint it because his name is Johnny Stones. He was a freelance. Um, how and much I'll, 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 tr- I'll try and find it right now. I'll, I'll just Google the two names. And it would have been 2008. Paddy Barnes, Johnny Stones. 2008. Johnny Stones, well, 2008. Got it. It was, it was for the independent. Oh, it says, sorry, this, there was an error generating this page. I think it was. But it is there. It is there. I'll yeah. try and if we can find it, I'll uh, I'll put it in the um, bio for this episode, the description for this episode. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where like I would love to do like I had an idea for a YouTube uh, like boxing series, like comedy series, obviously, where I would interview fighters in the ring, but on the condition that like don't try and hit me in anywhere. You know what I mean? Like we'll just we'll just keep busy. You know what I mean? We'll just throw a few, but. I, I mean, I'm guessing what I'd be right in saying, say me and you genuinely would spar, yeah. I wouldn't land anywhere near you, would it, at any point, if you didn't want me to? Yeah. Wouldn't land anywhere near, no, never. Making a stay, you would land on my gloves on my arm, like, but you wouldn't hit me in the face. Different yeah. if you sparred Sean McComb, you wouldn't touch him, because it is right. dead. But Colin is the same, but making a stay, you would land on my gloves. I, I would let you. Yeah. Because... My kind of attack would be, as you land, your hands out there, sign current your knees straight away. Right. You know what I mean? Do you know what I want to do? I want to register as an amateur, have a fight. Like, you you know, like, register on a Wednesday, have a fight on a Saturday, run the whole fight, and, and like, and obviously in a draw, like, no punches thrown, and then I then I retire and say I, I was a boxer, amateur, or retired undefeated. You know what? Why don't you just fight me? I'll let you win, because I'm used to losing anyway, so... It's nothing to me. <laughs> so me and you fight, where would we do it? Like Europa or something? Or Ulster Hall? Honestly. Uh, SSA, me yeah. and you fight. You're, but here's the thing. You've, you've done yourself there because you've just said that there was a guy called Johnny Stones who did the same thing and he landed one on you and you broke his ribs. So I think mm. what would happen is I'd land one, you would get flashbacks to Johnny Stones and all of a sudden I'm getting taken out <laughs> on a stretcher. I was young. Immature and inexperienced back then. Now I'm a man. Don't worry. Well, I, I wouldn't be at you. No, I think they're. Fam- I think they're famous last words. I think you know what I mean. You'd see the fans there. You just you just get the good feeling back, and you you'd spark me out. Well, it could happen. 
because it's talk, like I was talking to Sean last episode about you know it's always talked about comedians boxing like could we get a charity night or some sort of I hate to use the term local celebrity night you know where I mean let's be honest none of us are celebrities but um, that that was always talked about and I my attitude to it is if I know I'm going to win I will do it but I don't want anybody to punch me in the nose because. If, if my nose goes, like I've already broke my nose, you, it's just about off, don't nod, right? Like you're looking at it and going, yeah, yeah, no, I can see. It was put back into place, but it has a wee slight bend in it. So I, my looks are really all I have. Um, so I don't want to fight. I don't want to get in with someone who starts taking it seriously. Like my nose has been broke twice as well. Yeah. But you know what? You said out there about the comedians fighting. That's been done double. You had the likes of like Eric Lawler, yeah, no work. Um, big Fred. Is it Fred, Fred West? Cook. Fred Cook. Fred Fred West. Jeez, I hope they weren't getting Fred West involved. Oh, did, did Fred Eric Cook. Lauer, Freddy Cook. <laughs> Eric Lauer fight Fred West in a celebrity box match. <laughs> no, they all fought, and it was a brilliant night. And I put my man on up too for a laugh. And I would tell a more story. So I got my mate down to fight. Um, just the pair for us to go down in Dublin, all stay out, not burning hotel. You're, is your mate a boxer? No. No reason that. Um, right. But I pretended he was um, all Ireland champion. Right. And there weren't all oh, Irish champion on. Like, I had their boss for my life. I oh, really haven't. Polly told, told you about you. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, but no, I had never fought my life. Yeah. But when I took him around, I, I didn't kill him. Like, but yeah. it was we all thought it was fucking burning better when you're fought in my life. Because I think one of those things are uh, like the likes of white collar box and stuff like that. You could plan for, you could train for months, but like you were saying earlier about it's all well and good doing that, but you make one mistake. I think as soon as the bell would ring, everything out the window, especially oh, with a crowd there. And white collar is different because you know you can train and you can be absolutely amazing training. No, very good technical fighter. One thing missing, it's fighting in that atmosphere, the nerves, yeah, yeah. the ball drop, and that's that's massive. Yeah, that that is like. 80% of it, believe you, me. You've been doing coaching and, and I think didn't I think you started it just before lockdown and then obviously you've you've had to take a break from it, but you'll be you'll be doing it again. You're kind of training people in, in their houses. Is it difficult to when you get back to that will it be difficult when people make silly mistakes? You know, when you read things like, you know, when Roy Keane became a manager and Terry Henry became a manager they find they get very frustrated because the players they are managing aren't capable of doing what they could do. Is there an element of that with you or do you, or do you just go with it? No, because what I do, obviously, poly box, you call it. So I go to people's houses. It's 10 rounds of boxing with exercising. It's, it's a very, very tough session, but it's enjoyable. But there's no real emphasis on technique. I'm not going to show them, but I do try and teach them. Like the fundamentals of boxing, so they can do it. Do it. No, obviously, you want them to learn a bit. Yeah. I'm not strict and make sure to ah, I know you're throwing the job wrong, whatever. You know what I mean? It, it's more enjoyable, it's more for fitness. Yeah. But like, before lockdown, there, I know obviously I've had to take, take a big knife from it, but I was flying like, you know, couples and all going to their houses and training, people with kids, you know, coming to the gym and going there. And like, and plus, it's not even about training, it's about like, well being too because people couldn't get out of the house, couldn't meet people or talk to anyone. So I I was going to their house and like was talking to them and, and training them too. So it's a different physical and yep. mental aspects being being looked out there. Did people do what I did with that boxer ice class? Like did people think, Oh sure, ten rounds just hitting the thing? Did people do a round or two and just end up completely banjaxed? Well, I had Chris here done Chris here done ten rounds in furnace, but I thought he was gonna die and the job. Yeah. But thankfully, I, 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 I'm qualified in first aid. Um, so he was okay. See a fans. Didn't, yeah, didn't, I mean, didn't have to get moved to my foot. Yeah. Well, you didn't have to, but you did. And it was I, did. I didn't have to, but I did. Because I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't like to see the fella stuck. Yeah, yeah, get you. I think like, I would love to do that with you. Just And we could maybe shoot a video about it, but just to, just for the sheer laugh of it. Because like, I'm talking myself up here being like, I'm fit, you know, go out running and work out. There is not a mission. I'm going to box ten rounds in that and be standing at the end of it. No, you think that? I'll make sure you get through it. Don't worry. So after restrictions pending, yeah, exactly. Last method about 
Will Can I take my top off? For... Yeah. Baby oil in the ring on two. Yeah. I don't you, you can do what you want. See, speaking of, speaking of restrictions, right, you are very vocal about, about COVID, government, you know, all, just all, all this. And a lot of it probably stems from, I guess, your, your love for sport and you know more than anyone how good sport can be for, like, yeah. like you mentioned, people's, people's health or mental health and, and all that kind of thing. It, it, do you think part of it is the reason that it kind of frustrates you so much is because you're used to training so much, being around the environment, training, even when you stop boxing? It's all about being active, training, watching people do it, helping people. Is that part of the reason why why it's difficult to just have everything stop? Yeah, definitely. It obviously, isn't like you said. I am very vocal on the restrictions and obviously the the COVID stuff, but I'm vocal in the sense where I'm asking a lot of questions. Like obviously, I don't know the answers, but I ask a lot of questions on Twitter about reasons why like there are certain restrictions in place reasons why just, just just ask different questions and people shoot down at you like oh he's, a, he's an anti-vaxxer and he's fucking covid denier but i'm neither you know um yeah. i genuinely want to know, know the answer like and like i think people who don't ask questions are fucking just brain dead they like, just go oh, i Give me this here, or oh, we'll, we'll lock down for their legs if you say so. People need to ask questions. People need to solve themselves and ask questions. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Yep. Not no one ask questions. Um, but you know, obviously, at the start, it's a highly infectious virus, so there need to be some restrictions, obviously, in place in sport. Obviously, nearly all sports are contact, and there to be some restrictions, but. As it went on, I don't think there was any data to suggest that there was like outbreaks in sports. So yeah. that's that got my back up because you know people are training, like people like getting train with others for not just to be physically fit, but you know for their their well being too. And, yeah. You know, obviously, being from here, you know the mental health problem we have is fucking ridiculous. Um, and sport, sports, one of them, sport is not just for fitness, not just for well-being, but sport is one of those things that bring communities together. You know, in the fuck the place we live, sport yeah. is able to bring all all together and, and help. Boxing, um, boxing, boxing being boxing, the, 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 boxing. the big, boxing and football. You know, I play I play football at a, a, a low level, but I love it. And um, and there are two sports that are two very popular sports that are yeah. so good at. Just cutting through, cutting through all that. It's not a, it's not an issue. And a frustrating thing is, you you see guys that can play football in mixed football teams, travel to any estate, and it's not a bother. Yeah. Yet you can still see these same people be sectarian and bigoted, and you're going, well, if it doesn't bother you in the football pitch, why why is it why is it bothering you anywhere else? But you know what? You're always going to get people out there, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, like, fuck him. Like, like, look at me. Like, like, people know who I am. I'm a Catholic, whatever. Who cares? I can go anywhere. Like, I know people in the Shangle, and I actually train people from the Beaver State. I've trained people in the Shangle. I've trained people in Lisburn. Like, staunch lawyer stories. Like, people see me in you know, their house. Like, no one cares. Like, they'll say, all right, what's happening? Like, People are starting to wage up. That I feel like obviously you'll get on both sides, decades both sides. But generally speaking, like you know, I think it's a it's a, it's a better place now than, than it was. Oh, of course, and a, a good example of that is, before, you you know, like the the Rangers title winning party uh, night on on the Shankle. I think if that was any other time, there would be a riot. Just just because. Just, be, just because there would have been interface problems and all that kind of thing, but it's weird that a, a kind of a year inside and a bit of lockdown has made even like the biggest nationals be like, 
fucking enjoy your day, lads. You know, just over the baseball guys going, fucking, here, have, a, have a can, you know, and they're, they're throwing stuff, but this time it's just yeah. refreshments. They're obviously, they're obviously not going that far, but you know what I mean? There was definitely an attitude, not with everyone, but of some people. Yeah. Big Celtic fans going, enjoy it, because we had it for so long. And you wouldn't have had that kind of thing before. Nah. You know, so it does give you, it does give you hope like, in some way, but I'm not a massive Celtic fan. I, I, I like them because I, I train in Scotland now and since I came, my dad sported them. Like, I, I'm more of a Clemo fan, but yeah. I was disheartened. Like, they didn't do the 10 in a row, you know what I mean? It was a big, big one. Um, but for, for Peter Rangers putting the first ever title, so part of the, the enjoyable thing about sport and Rangers probably couldn't be considered an underdog, like when you consider what they've won in the past and they are. Have have been the second best team for that decade. Well, some of them. Um, but what I mean is that's the to me, like yeah, I'm not in the Scottish football at all. I was talking when I had Paddy McDonald on the podcast. Don't know whether it was on the podcast or off it. We were talking about Celtic and Rangers and that kind of thing. I I, I look out for Celtic results because in one of the first championship managers I had, I got the Celtic job. I started off at. I think it was Motherwell or Partick Thistle, and then I got the Celtic job. And it was, you're talking like Larson, um, Bobby Petta, Bobby Petta. Um, Tom Boyd. It was that era of team. And I remember being in Wise Buys, not Wise Buys, um, I think Bargain Books maybe in Conswater when I was a kid. And there was a Celtic diary, and I swear I think it was 10p because I don't think they were selling many of them. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and I remember getting it, and it was a diary that I never used. But it's weird that, like, it's like I, I barely support Man United, and, I, and I've been over to a load of games, and I have, I've had nearly every kit, so I support any other team a lot less. But it's just the fact that here, yeah, like, I obviously support. You know, Man United and no other. It's a bit like Irish League clubs. Like people are obsessed with knowing what club you support. We want to put people in a box or in a category straight away. Really? It's like who do you, who do you, who do you support Celtic or Rangers? And I go, I don't support either of those teams in Scottish football. And people are like, I know, but who do you support? And you're going, no, genuinely, like it's it's Scottish football. I don't support any of these teams. I think people will start to hopefully care less about all that kind of thing like sooner, sooner the better as well because it's fucking ridiculous I think either knock it on the head or if you want to keep going with it have like one big fight I'm joking Jesus Christ I'm joking I don't want that to be a headline in the telegraph or anything um, you know what I mean like a big field somewhere like wherever they did Battle of the Boyne I think that is still just like big open fields off on the hard shoulder so which should we get the best fight in Catholic we get the best fight in Pazin which would be uh Connor Burns versus Connor Burns versus Jim Milton. Do you know what that that would shift tickets? All right, well, look, all right, all right, can we get on the baller, Jimmy Bryson as a referee? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's the sort of thing. After lockdown, people just want entertainment. That's not a bad <laughs> idea, and that could happen. <laughs> but yeah, boxing is so good at, at cutting through that. And you know, you hear fighters who trained. And train in different parts of Belfast, and it's just it's not an issue. And it's one of those yeah. things where, like, we we make jokes about it, and I I do in stand up and and on podcasts and all that kind of thing. But it's like if you don't laugh about it, you cry. Like it is me- it is beyond mental. That you have to make you have to joke about it. You have to. Thing. But how is it still a thing? Like it is still a thing. I think it's about four hundred guys roughly that are still really into it, and everybody else just sort of goes with it because those lads love it. Like, don't get me wrong, there are lads who love it. I'm not denying that, but I think that it's a very small group of them, but yeah, I don't know, it's crazy. I think it's one of those things where, like, after lockdown, we should just all be like, look, let's pretend it didn't happen and we'll just move, let's get these walls down and move on. But here, you know what? The walls never come down. And the reason for that, because at the minute, they're, they're tourist attractions. So, I think there's too much money. You know, for tourists, tourists flock to see these balls, these peace balls. I think the only ones in Europe. Well, I think what we could do is make them like garage doors. You know, when the tourist goes, like make the last bus seven o'clock at night and then just like 
leave leave the <laughs> Yeah. Leave the door up. Yeah, le- yeah, we temporary ones, and yeah. we wait, and then you know, maybe even we stage a few like fake riots or whatever during the day. Like, but it's fa- it's like uh, they're like plastic bottles to look like glass, or what do you call that uh, glass? Sugar, sugar glass. Sugar glass. Sugar glass. One hundred percent, fellas. Fire and sugar. Oh fuck, he's got me. Catch him. Oh, oh, down. And then as soon as the last, bu- keep an eye out. Last bus is gone. Right, lads, let's have a barbecue. You know what I mean? That's, That's what I like to see. Straight, straight down to Kelly Sailor for 10 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look, as soon as we can, we'll definitely do that. We'll definitely spar. I think that would be a lot of fun. No, oh, Jesus Christ, sorry, not spar. No, we'll do the paddy box thing. We're not going to spar. We're we'll not going to spar. We'll see. What about me and you on the undercard of, of Burnsy versus Jim Wilson? That's it. No, no, I, 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 no, I don't, I don't trust it. Actually, you know what? On Twitter, yeah, Robin Spawn, yeah, just gained the fate me. He said he would. Oh, he, he said he would. He said he, he needs some training. I think. I genuinely he's think. Out I genuinely think he's. I think he might have a bit if he's saying that. I think he's going. Yeah, sure. I'm just a politician. I reckon because he is like the most high pressure job probably you could have in politics at the minute which is saying something for here um i would say as soon as he gets home i, I think he's i think he's on the heavy bag like. well listen there's only one way to find out i'll fight him no problem i think what i'll fight him he wins the lockdown <laughs> ended i win the <laughs> 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 Do you know what, what would be terrible? If you lost that, everybody would fucking... Believe me, I would make sure he dies in a ring or something. I, I wouldn't have been I, I would... I, I, my, 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 that's a tough one to call. I think I think Swan's got a bit. And you know what I'm, I think I'm he does? Sweet. I think at the end he takes the gloves off and he just gives it to Swan's. <laughs> he shows you the guns, 100%. <laughs> oh my God. I forgot the problem with Swan's. Yeah. See, right, that'd be funny. Yeah, he, he says he says he says you have to you're lying on the canvas but to be taken away in a stretcher and he goes, You just got attacked by two swans, mama. Um <laughs> enjoyable. All right, well Paddy, cheers for uh cheers for coming on. No problem at all. I'm glad to be on. I, I appreciate it. And uh I'm, I'm yeah. happy actually it's it's your hundredth podcast, Murray. Hundredth episode of the podcast, Paddy's Day. Jeez. I mean it's a no brainer. My kids do not believe my name is Patrick because it's Patrick's Day. They yeah, I mean, it, I mean, what would be more unbelievable? It's not just Patrick, but if it was Patrick Parr. I'm actually raising it out there, you know. If you, do you know what Paddy Parr sounds like? Okay, it just sounds like the betting shop. Patrick Parr sounds like a a refined gentleman. You know what I mean? Like Patrick Parr sounds like. I I do not look like a refined gentleman, do. I think you change your name to Patrick, you get Suter to give you a top hat. It can happen. Especially if teeth fixed, hair done. Invisalign. What's the code? What's the code again? Let's shout it out. Go to Guantanamo, West Belfast, Barnes, 50. Yes, 100%. I mean, if my Invisalign doesn't work out, I'll, I'll come back. Go back, swear to God, 50 quid off. Yeah. No brainer. I mean, I didn't think my teeth were bad. And then I looked at photos of me before I had it. I went, oh no, how did that guy ever get on TV? No, I'm blind and I, I'm as bad, so. Yeah. All right, well, look, we'll, we'll, compare, we'll compare teeth when we, when we box. Um, Paddy, appreciate you coming on. Cheers. Take no it problem. easy. Have a good day.